Right, well, good evening. Can you hear? Yes, I think you can hear. Um, I've said good evening, ladies and gentlemen, i.e. people. I always hate that when we talk about homo sapiens, it seems quite improper. So there we are. We're trying to mix together engineering businesses and creative design communities. That's from the website I got. Um, I think my qualifications for being here here are, have been exaggerated enough already. Um, I did found a business to break free of the conflict between capital and labor, which I think is a basic conflict in people, which we won't, I'm not going to talk about much, but um, it will come up occasionally. Um, so then I'm going to talk a bit about design as being um, in an abstract way and then relieve the te tedium by showing what this has meant in practice as a designer for buildings. So design is the process of identifying what activities could benefit people and then putting the activities into use. This is obviously deliberately abstract in an attempt to widen the scope of design. The word system covers the activities that need to be designed we have no difficulty in identifying the aesthetic properties of a piece of poetry or a painting as art that brings benefit to people. When we see the artifacts of an ancient society, we see buildings and cities as designed objects that bring benefit. Buildings present an opportunity for discussion. There are buildings where the design is strongly pragmatic some of them have evolved by a kind of natural selection. Oh, we better go on to the next slide. How do I do that? No? There we are. Oh, look, that covers what I've said. No, not quite. There we, this is an artifact giving pleasure. Sorry, benefit. Um, <clears throat> so... I've got to some buildings evolving by natural selection, and I think probably that is an example. It's Marrakesh. Um, now, if you say the design life of a building is, say, 100 years, then evolution in 10 generations takes 1,000 years. A cob cottage and a Doha vernacular hut are both made of mud and reeds, and... Um, I've, I've pressed the down button. Ah, no. Oh, well, <laughs> never mind. Um, I, th I hope sooner or later we will have a cob cottage. But the thing about a cob cottage and a Doha um, marsh Arab sort of hut is that they are both naturally lit. They both have natural lighting to about 100 lux in the light conditions that are, are normal, like bright sunlight, obviously, in Arabia, and an overcast sky in Northern Europe. But 100 lux inside is what you get. If you make the openings too big, it's thermally uncomfortable. And if you make them too small, you can't see. So the designs have evolved to produce about 1,000, 100 lux. And so that's an evolutionary process which has developed that design. Then there are buildings, where are we? Right. Then there are buildings involving conscious aesthetic judgments. So architecture is sometimes designed, but perhaps not always. Now that we have strong functional requirements for sustainability, the functional and the aesthetic. Systems engineering is a term used to cover other activities that could do with some design philosophy. The NHS, for example. A battle group to engage in war in Iraq with its need for supply of support together with suitable armament, air support, coping with victory or defeat. A company structure. The design of systems covered, covers any design activity. Scope describes what needs to be included in the design brief. 
should the scope be restricted in any way? We could spend ages on this question, but I prefer to imagine that the universe represents a boundary that is defined to be as unrestricted as anything could be. The boundary is at infinity. Unless we are designing a piece of astronomical equipment or space exploration, we can probably bring the boundary into the edge of the solar system. The notion of planet Earth means that everything we do is space travel, so that bringing the boundary in so close has its difficulties. We must be careful since global warming involves an understanding of the heat transfer across the boundaries if we take the solar system. And that's part of our problem at the moment. The climates of hot, dry climates like Riyadh, a hot, moist climate like Singapore, a temperate climate like ours, or an extreme climate like Kamchatka, I remember the name, and the minus 40 centigrade winter, 46 degrees centigrade summer, all represent a different set of design conditions which should be included in the scope, the design scope. In fact, typical office buildings are being designed for all these climates with the design only marginally different. The Royal Academy of Engineering has produced a pamphlet on systems engineering, which you might be interested in looking at, and I don't have the reference, but it's on the web. I hope this opening gives you the impression that design covers the process of obtaining everything that people need. So now I'm going to talk to something about how, how you get somebody who aspires to be the kind of designer which I represent. Uh, so it's me. Um, so my education started after some false starts, and I had an arty, pretentious education where lessons were voluntary, but every morning there was an hour of something called useful work. Useful work was maintaining the school using craftsmanship, and we learned the craftsmanship an hour a day. That was a very valuable experience because it makes you learn that your mind controls your hand without any intellectual or linguistic intervention. And it's very important to have a respect for people who can do that with their, with their hands. I then went to university with a career mapped out in my mind as a science research academic. Well, I can't write. So I didn't do very well, and I couldn't write good essays. Um, I had difficulty persuading myself that engineering uh, would suit me, although, of course, what I enjoyed was making things. I comforted myself with the thought that helping buildings, helping to make buildings, is helping to make the objects which are the icons of culture. So that got me good and pretentious. Um, I then went on a, a conversion course, which was absolutely terrible. I expected to be taught the practicalities of engineering, and I was taught a kind of half-baked theory. And then my mentor, who was a professor of architecture at Cambridge, got me a job. And we did, um, I started working as an engineer, and I was called a development engineer. And it was really interesting because, we'll move on from the education. Right, so now we're on, finished with education. Um, I was given very interesting jobs to do, which were sort of researchy. And in one of them, I mustn't jump ahead too quickly, um, we, I worked on several buildings and developed a kind of fan heater which could meter the heat um, so that we could use less energy for university study bedrooms. And that was patented. But the, the firm I worked for actually got the benefit of the patent. And I also had an idea which, which we decided was too difficult. But if we'd revisited that idea every year, I think we would have got ahead of Dakin, who are now sweeping the market with with the idea of using refrigerant distributed all the way around buildings as a heat transfer fluid. 